As a child, it, I've always been around food. I've always been in the kitchen with the maids, with my mom. My mom was a great, fabulous cook. And I think the skill set passed on from her straight to me because both my sisters can burn water. They are that good at cooking. Horrible, actually. <laughs> When I was in the 8th or 9th standard, I started taking orders for cakes and I used to do a black forest in Bombay in the 8th standard. So even while choosing a career, everyone was like, was going for these talk shows and these great uh, classes where they helped you pick a career and they did an IQ. I just knew I would either want to be a chef or a lawyer. And although it sounds too extreme, I'm the third kid who really knew how to harrow my sisters, so I was very good at arguing. So, so you know, I have converted an ardent hobby into a career. So firstly, I never work a day in my life because I just love what I do. I can cook 24 hours a day, 48 hours a day. That's something that I enjoy. So what inspires me is, if you're talking about people, then definitely my mentors, I always go back to see what they are doing and how off the beaten track can you go. The best way to describe my food is if I show you the poetry that I've written on the first cover of my menu that I say my food has no borders, no boundaries, no inhibitions. On a single plate you can have a touch of Vietnam with a touch of France coming perfect harmony. The fish curry was invented a million years ago and everyone keeps doing that and nobody is going out of that. So even like when I was doing my YouTube channel, I never did Goen, I did modern Goen. Where I have taken Goen ingredients, Goen flavors that we all can identify it and twisted it with international influence. Because today, food has again become so versatile with communication, with technology, that you can learn so much. So it's about bringing those principles into old school cooking and styling it to a whole new level. So cooking is a science, there's cause and reaction and people don't realize that. You have to look at the cause that you're putting in and understand the reaction before you even create it. So when I say Goan food doesn't need to scream Goan because it's something that we all know. It's something that we all understand. It's something that we all have in our DNA. You don't need to call it out as Goan, like even if I've done the corned wheel tongue carpaccio, you have not called it out as Goan, but till date any guest who has dined at this restaurant has always said, oh my god, this is so Goan yet so international. If you say what are my signature dishes, it's like I'm a child, and I'm a parent and these are my kids and you can't pick favourites. So I'm, a, I'm basically a mad crack scientist actually who makes a menu, doesn't like it, tears it, throws it out. Makes a menu, doesn't like it, tears it, throws it out. Yeah, so I need, I flavour pair and I have a very distinct memory. I have a pictorial memory so I can see a plate even before I draw it. So when I, so I always say you eat with your eyes, you subconsciously sniff when you lift up a spoon and only then do you put it in your mouth. So eating is a three-step approach. If you like what you see, you will pick it up. When you pick it up, before putting it into your mouth, you subconsciously sniff it. And then only it goes into your mouth. So our plating is always art personified. And if a customer tells me that, oh my God, it's so pretty, I don't want to disturb it, I'm ready to go home. That's like a day well done. So that's something for me. So uh, while Goa is, fast becoming, I'm saying not yet there, but at the precipice of it, it's fast becoming the food capital of the country. And I'll tell you why, because Goa is literally like a melting pot. So there's a lot of tourists that come in and from there they go to the entire country. So when we were thinking of opening a restaurant, there was no other place than we could than Goa because firstly, Goa holds a very important significance to me as I'm going. And secondly, why not start something where it all began? You know, because I've really come a full circle. I've traveled the entire globe and come back to where I started my career at. And that was why Goa. Now, when we were, when we were actually starting construction for this place, 
uh, I just put up a teaser on my stories on Instagram where I turned around and said something exciting coming soon. And I had about at least 800 messages on Instagram asking me, is this white plate 2.0? And then we're three partners. So there's Sebastian D'Souza, there's Chris Castellino and me. So three of us, when I showed them these messages, I said, you know, look, we cannot name the restaurant anything other than White Plate by Chef Jason because that's what I'm known by. And if I, since the White Plate in Bangalore had shut down, we had shut down that White Plate, it was perfect for us to open up White Plate in Goa, where the name carried already the past experience that could just elevate it. My eccentricities, my craziness, my need for perfection, my need to plate every dish. This is what gives me the satisfaction that, okay, I'm on the right track, you know, because otherwise it's very difficult to work with me. Fortunately, I'm blessed with a team that has worked with me over the last few years, so they already understand me. But for a new person to come in and work with someone like me who's if I want A, I need A. I don't need your brains, I need your hands. You know, I'm like that. Uh, don't think if I've plated a dish, if one particular garniture is at one particular place, it has to be there because I have the pictorial memory. You can't change it because you felt like. So for the team to understand that and consistently give me that is, yeah. Oh, I have a lot of rules. I have a lot of rules. So I have a rule that uh, you have to be disciplined. Discipline plays a very important role in achieving greatness and perfection. You have to be disciplined. If you're not disciplined, you can't work with me. If you have zero ambition, you can't work with me. So when I conduct interviews and people ask me, like everyone asks me, what's my favorite question? My question to people is, where do you see yourself in five years? And if I don't find that ambitious enough, I don't hire the person. Because if you have zero ambition, you can't work with me. You're dead weight that I'll carry. So for me, the rules that I have in my kitchen is, I am only as strong as my weakest link. So my job and the entire team's job is to enrich the weakest link so that we, in, in, we improve the overall strength quotient of the entire group. Oh my God, there are so many. So, so when I started working uh, with Gordon, so what you see Gordon on TV is Gordon on a good day. He's a lot worse, okay? He can't showcase that on TV because of the TRPs and all that. He has a bit of aggression, aggression, but not too much. So with Gordon, there was a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, a lot of highly skilled. So that need of being perfect was inculcated with Gordon. Okay, because you have to always be at your A game. There's no like, oh, I'm not in my A game today. I can, I'll be at my A game tomorrow. They, you can't. So you have to be at your A game every single day with him. And uh, he's a firecracker. So there's always F's, B's, all the lovely language that passes. And the reason why I have an open kitchen and I'm a great, great fan of the open kitchen is so that it's very easy for me to go all the words in between. It's very easy for me to throw pans. And how do I tone down that aggression is by having an open kitchen, where I can't do it because I have guests sitting all around, some guests sit here. So now I have devised a metric system for the team. If I give you a one, you know, what are the six bad words that go behind that one? If I give you a two, so like, if I turn around and I say, you get a one, you get a two, you get a three. The fourth time you have to step out of the kitchen and I'll deal with you outside. So that's the system that I have evolved over here. So that is basically come down from Gordon. Okay, that need to be perfect, that need to always, and it's high pressure because you're, you're delivering to some of world-class patrons who know food. You can't, cannot be in, inconsistent, you cannot not be at your A game because you not being at your A game is messing someone's dining experience. And everyone asks me, how are you 4.9 on Google? And there's a reason, because you have to be consistently perfect. If you're not consistently perfect, you'll just drop. Now, Alan Dukas was ice. If you made a mistake also, he would come and tell you and teach you, but he was calm. 
So when I worked with him, the only thing I was waiting was when is the bomb going to break? When is the bomb going to break? When is the bomb going to break? When is he going to scream? When is he going to scream? Well, but he never screamed. So he was another calm and calculated gentleman. But now they've become so big that we've been like just one of their sous chefs of the 300 restaurants that they own. What's next? We're just starting. So while White Plate is opening here, White Plate is going to open in many other destinations. And someday I will open up Jason, which if White Plate is the stairway to heaven, Jason is heaven. Let's cook now, please. So we are bang in the season of mangoes, but what are we really, really, really doing with a mango? All we do is eat it in its own natural form or just go right ahead and put it in a dessert. But there are fun ways to actually twist a mango and create a fantastic Thai mango chicken curry. So I'm going to show you how to create one very new age, very modern, yet enjoying a mango to the max. Let's get to cooking it. All I've done is taken four mangoes and squeezed them because I want that natural juice to come right off into a bowl. Into that, I'm going to take about eight bird eye chilies, about a teaspoon of turmeric, a little bit of ginger. You can use Thai ginger or use regular ginger, about eight cloves of garlic, a little bit of brown sugar, about a tablespoon of it going in. A stalk of a lemongrass, just squeeze it nicely and put that in. Four, five lime leaves going in. You can go even higher. The juice of one lemon. Four tablespoons of some fish sauce. There's nothing Thai without this glorious fish sauce, right? So about four tablespoons of that and about two tablespoons of dark soy sauce. Now all you do is allow this bowl to macerate and let everything come together for about 15 minutes. Puree it in the blender and you have the most easiest, divine and decadent Thai mango sauce ready. So into a nice and hot cast iron pan, I'm just going to squirt in some oil and what I do is I like to add different oils so that they intensify. So out here I'm starting off with some sunflower oil, about 20 to 30 mils of that and I'm going to grill this chicken which has been lightly dusted with flour. minutes into the process, all I'm going to do is flip them over and we're going to take them out. Now I always ensure that I cook the chicken to just about 80% done so that they cook the last smile in the gravy and absorb all that mangoey goodness. And now you must be wondering why did I coat it in flour? It's very simple for firstly to lock in all the flavors of the chicken and secondly it adds as a thickener into the gravy. So now it's about deglazing the pan so the second oil goes in and out here I'm using some cold pressed coconut oil. Once that is nice and hot into that I'm just going to take one lemongrass and bruise it. Basically, just go about taking all my work frustrations into this lemongrass and throw it right in. Put that in. Along with that, you put about a tablespoon of finely chopped ginger, about a tablespoon of finely chopped garlic, three to four kaffir lime leaves, and you want that heat, and that heat comes together with four or five bird eye chilies. Just put that in and allow it to deglaze, scrape off all those gnarly bits right at the base and bask in the scent that it brings. Perfectly burnished, bruised and brown. Now is the time to take that mango, highly fragrant emulsion and put it right in. 
watch out, it's going to splutter and create quite a havoc in your kitchen. Into this, you take about a cup full of water and add that in. And what's a Thai curry without some coconut milk? So about 200 ml of coconut milk going into that as well. Adjusting the color and the consistency. So in goes a little bit more water and another 200 ml of coconut milk. So you need this to be a subtle yellow color, but the flavor needs to be bang on right. Bring this to a simmer for about 15 minutes and it's time to just drop in some veggies into it. Now is the time to drop in the veggies. So in goes about 100 grams of carrots, about a handful of some pea brinjols, some asparagus spears, you can go right ahead and use some broccoli, some baby radish. You can use anything that takes your fancy. Just crush about four or five lemon leaves and put that in as well. And at this stage, it's time to take that chicken and put it right in. Allow this to simmer for another 10 minutes and a decadent, New age concept of a Thai mango curry is ready. Perfectly simmered and just about adjusting the seasoning, that is add your salt and pepper at the last mile. It's time to take another 200 ml of coconut milk and put it on top and switch this lovely gravy off. Now you can pair this either with some steamed rice or just some steamed noodles and dig right into it. What a fun way to use mango right into our lives other than eating them or having them in a dessert. Garnishing this is really simple. All I do is just shrivel up some basil leaves and throw it on top. And I take about four bird eye chilies and I don't slit it. What I do is I leave it whole so the chili goodness without that heat comes right through and through. This is ready to be enjoyed either with some steamed rice, some jasmine rice if you want to go down the fancy route, or some plain boiled noodles in a bowl, sitting in front of the TV and enjoying mangoes in a twisted yet all new way.